Welcome to Millionaire Mondays, the show where we bring you the stories of real Indian startups told by the entrepreneurs that built them. I'm Caleb Friesen, and on the show today, we're going to do something a little bit different because my wife and I just had our first child, and so I'm on a partial paternity leave here. And a lot of people don't realize this, but way back when Backstage with Millionaires was still a very small channel, before we had one lakh subscribers, or even before we had 10,000 subscribers, we actually recorded podcasts with the founders of 100 Indian startups. And most of these episodes got a couple hundred views, maybe one or 2,000 if we were lucky. But today, I want to dig up one of those episodes from the archives, an interview that I did with the founder of Fusion Charts, Balav Nadhani. So Fusion Charts is this incredible platform for creating really beautiful and dynamic charts, and it's a popular, successful SaaS brand. And so when I sat down with Balav in December of 2019, about 85% of Fortune 500 companies were customers of Fusion Charts. Even Barack Obama is a huge fan of the platform. And so to support all 28,000 plus of their customers, Fusion Charts employed a team of 100 people across India and the United States. But in my opinion, what makes Fusion Charts such an interesting and impressive company is the fact that Balav actually bootstrapped it from the age of 17 until he sold the company in 2020 to an American company called Idera. And of course, being bootstrapped, the company was also consistently profitable too. Balav has since gone on to sell another one of his businesses, Charts.com, which was acquired by an American firm, Mode Analytics. And he's also an investor in more than 100 startups, about half of which are in his own personal capacity as an angel investor. Of course, that's today in 2023. And Balav's story begins more than two decades decades ago in 2002, when, like many startup founders from the early 2000s, he began his journey with a blog. Fortunately, I had some background in coding, which I learned myself, and I used that skill to basically write an article on how to build interactive charts on the web, got that published, got the first taste of money from publishing of an article, and I felt really, really good. I'm like, hey, here's a skill you can use on the internet to make some money. Then why don't I just keep on doing this over and over again? Uh, through a series of incidents, through a series of uh, good timing and good luck, uh, it eventually became a product. So I call myself an accidental entrepreneur. Uh, that being said, all the motions in the mind that you went through when you were 17, I had pretty much the same. It's just that uh, because of good timing, good luck, and a lot of things which fell in place, here we are. So I guess it, was, it would have been three years then that you sort of ran Fusion Charts on your own from 17 until 19. Um, and then, so I'm curious to know, what were you able to accomplish on your own in those three years? And then what was the point where you realized that, okay, it's time to start onboarding some, some team members? So during the first of those three years, I was pretty much clueless about what to do. All I knew was, hey, I'm writing some code, people like what I'm doing, and some of them are paying me money for it. So keep uh, repeating this, rinse and repeat. One thing led to another, they asked for more features, they asked for more chart types in our product, kept on doing that. Uh, till I hit a point where there was too, there were too many requests for me to just do it by myself. And I had no clue on how to hire because I'd never been hired, I'd never worked at a job. So I called up a friend of mine, actually a cousin, and he, had, uh, he was at that point in time building a product of his own. He referred me to his friend. So that friend joined me and both of us were working from my bedroom for another year, year and a half. Uh, till a point again when both of us were overloaded with all the requests. So the only thing which worked for us at that point in time is we were very ignorant about what we are doing. But what we knew was that whatever we were building, people are paying for that. And they are asking for more and more things, which means that we are in the right direction. So from two people in a bedroom to then starting to think about, hey, we need to hire more. That was one key inflection point, which we started in 2005. 2005, okay. But then backtracking a little bit, uh, when it was just the two of you, First of all, was he sort of the same age as you at that time? or He was probably a year or two younger, elder to me. Okay, so that's perfect. You, you're able to kind of connect on that level. Right. Um, but was, I mean, he, he must have been a little bit hesitant to like work in a bedroom for a year, right? Like, or, or was he sort of like, was he sold on the idea and he was... So uh, the fortunate fact was that because he was referred by my cousin uh, and a friend and he had, I think, just come out of his engineering college as well. So he was also looking for experiences. The second fortunate fact uh, in hindsight is he was in Calcutta and you don't have too many good opportunities in Calcutta, at least back, uh, back in those days. So he was like, hey, here's a product, I'm getting paid well. Uh, there's no fixed timings, there's flexibility of when I want to come and when, when I want to go. And um, yeah, it's just a, 
uh, good work environment because it's just two of us. There are no rules. So that sure, out. yeah, lots of fun. I'm sure those early days were really exciting. And so around 2005, then you, how many how many customers were you working with at that point? Over a thousand customers for sure. Over a thousand customers, right? Just the two of you. Just the two of us, yeah. Oh my goodness! But th- so they weren't like Fortune 500 companies at that. There point. were. I mean, a whole there were. Yeah. So what would happen? So our business model was very different. We would put it out on our web. People would search for us, or through some of our content marketing, they would find us. Uh, come, swipe the credit card, buy. They didn't know that it was two two guys. They working. didn't know it was from India. They didn't know it was just two guys. They all they knew was, hey, this product really works, and it works beautifully. That's hilarious. That's awesome. And then, okay, so then you started building your team and sort of scaling up a little bit. Um, did you did you shift into an office then after moving out of your bedroom? That is right. So uh, after that, we got a sort of a garage style office, though we decorate, decorated it well enough. So that was our first office where we started hiring. Uh, we picked out from that office in 2009 when we hit a cap of 20 people. And then we moved to another office. Then we moved to Bangalore. I mean, this is in a nutshell. We can go into details of each one of them. Uh, but that's the first time where I really had to go out and start looking out for people through the traditional process of, uh, hey, here's a job description. I have to call for CVs. I have to look through that. I have to evaluate them. I have to interview them. They have to trust us. They have to trust two young guys with weird hairstyles and sitting in the basement of a big building. So that was a pretty interesting process in hindsight. Yeah. But I'm sure, like, I mean, having a couple of prominent uh, big name customers. It, it must not have been super hard. Like people could tell that you guys were on the right path, right? Uh, that depends on how people look at companies. So this is 2005 in Calcutta. Two things, Calcutta was not known for product companies. Second, that time startups are not very common in India. It's a very risky move. Uh, third, people want to go for stable jobs in big brand companies. Uh, fourth, you're looking at two 20 year olds who have no idea about uh, HR policies, who have no idea about interview processes, we have no idea basically about anything apart from just building good products. So, uh, I mean, I can talk about the first interview which happened and it went in a very funny way. So when we moved to the new office, which is the garage style office, which we still have, uh, we called a guy for interview. So basically we floated some of these requirements online. Uh, this guy contacted us online, came to our office. It was, uh, I don't remember why, but it was just me in the office that day. Uh, the other guy was not there. So I went and opened the office door, asked him to sit while, uh, was just getting ready for the uh, process. Uh, so it's a 20 seater office, nobody's in office, it's just me. I opened the door, asked him to sit. And then after five minutes, uh, I asked him to come inside. He looked around and said, who's gonna take my interview? I said, I'm gonna take your interview. His expression was priceless. He probably thought I was the office boy who's just there to open the door <laughs> for him and give him the uh, refreshment. And uh, uh, yeah, took his interview. Unfortunately, Never he didn't join. He didn't join, obviously he was not convinced about it. So later I realized that, uh, especially when you're interviewing in these early stages and when you don't have a brand, especially when you're in a city like Calcutta, at least Calcutta back then, perceptions play a very important role. And since then obviously this um, more focus on uh, building that brand for Fusion Charts from a hiring perspective, apart from just the customer perspective as well. For sure, I'm sure he's beating himself up about that interview today though? Well, funnily, he became a consultant to us, worked for us after we had a fairly decent sized team. Oh, so, okay, he uh, came back. Yeah, so he did come back, but uh, the story sticks with us. Did things sort of go more smoothly after that or was the hiring process still a bit uh, tumultuous? No, so then I realized that, hey, I'm definitely doing something wrong. So I reached out to a friend of mine who runs a fairly mid-sized uh, services company in Calcutta. Went to him, asked him, hey, how do you guys hire? Then he opened the Pandora's box and we like, hey, this is the process that you need to follow. This is the, uh, these are the set of recruitment companies or online portals you need to go. This is how they will come and apply. This is your interview process. This is how you need to roll out a job offer. I never knew what a job offer letter is at that point in time. This is what you need to do with some of the HR policies, which at that point we didn't do. But over a span of next two, three years, we realized the importance of HR policies. We realized the importance of very simple things like official holidays, casual leaves, planned leaves. Basically, all of these were very alien concepts to me uh, because I'd never worked anywhere. Mm -hmm. So all of these things then we planned. And uh, because we were uh, growing pretty fast in the early years uh, and our product was used by a lot of customers, I think the key thing was getting the first two or three core employees who uh, of which uh, two of them are still with us and getting them to convince other people that it's a good place to come and join. Apart from, so funny stories also like uh, when some of the people would come and join, 
it's not just them who would come they would also bring the parents to the office they will talk to the other people they will talk to us about the history of the company why should uh, their kids join us what is the safety net for them and we have we would have to explain to them uh, obviously this is now in the, uh, in the past but those are some of the things we had to do to convince people why it's a safe bet but i think once we hit about 8 or 10 people then it became relatively easier because the other guys would come and see talk to these guys and they would get more uh, comfort by talking to their peers here and then yeah we hit the 20 cap for our office i think 20 or 22 uh, in 2008 end so then we had to move out to a bigger office and since then the team has been expanding gotcha i'm trying to picture what the company culture would have been like at that point cuz i mean you guys were I, i think at that point still teenagers right like i was you were in the 20s or 20s early 20s yeah but still i mean that's that's quite young to mm-hmm. be an entrepreneur most people are just finishing their college right um was it was it like crazy and exciting or was it pretty professional and what was it like uh we actually didn't know the word culture back then we had no idea what culture means so it was very organic uh chaotic for sure uh the good thing is we focused on what was relevant for the business which is like hey let's keep focus on building good products let's ensure customers have a good experience with us good customer support take pride in building global products from india so till uh, i think till for 2010 india was not known for a product economy and we started 2002 and we are shipping to customers across the world and funnily we would take pride that less than 1% of our customers are in india 99% of our customers were global which and uh, that actually was uh, validated later when we would go to trade shows in india and when we would meet some of our customers they would be surprised they would say hey we thought you guys are a non indian company we are like no we've been in india and more so in calcutta uh, always this time so that was a testament to the fact that we had been doing uh, we had been building good products giving good services to, giving good uh, support to our customers as well so from a culture perspective it was always always about hey let's build products we are proud about let's ensure great customer experience and let's keep learning so most of our early guys they at least if i remember it correctly they did not even have a engineering or any professional degree so to speak they were self taught coders they were just hustlers uh, willing to learn on their own and there were no such fixed office timing so to speak it is like hey work needs to be done let's get it done so that was the original culture obviously as and when the team expanded we had to put in some uh, policies around so so as to ensure that there's a, a conformity around some basic hygiene stuff uh, but apart from that pretty organic i just want to ask you a quick question uh, you had mentioned the whole uh, indian customer thing why, why was that a point of pride for you guys that only like 1% of your customers were indian so there were two reasons to that one if you're sitting in india and and you're able to sell globally it's a testament to the fact that your product is of global quality and you can ship it from india now it's a very common fact but back then we didn't have playbooks or ecosystems to be able to help us i can give you an example so when you started selling for the first time uh, we didn't have a payment gateway on our site we didn't know what's a payment gateway so customers would send us checks handwritten and checks from uk us canada i mean name a country and some of those checks would be such a small amount that our bank processing fees would be more than the value of the check wow then when we got our first payment gateway when we realized that hey there's something called a payment gateway uh, you laugh at it but that guy would charge 25% of the entire transaction fees from our product as the payment gateway commission but it was still worthwhile because of the convenience factor convenience yeah, because suddenly now you'd just go online you'd sleep you'd go to party come back the next morning you'll see hey three new customers bought the product you were so th- you were lo- losing 20 for 5% of your oh my gosh to this payment gateway that is right that's just good. for processing the payment yeah wow. and you, but you were saying that you had uh, over 1000 customers i'm sure that number had grown by the time that you guys set, signed up with this payment gateway so uh, the first was check from the check to payment gateway i think it was about 2003 when we signed the payment gateway right 2003 to i don't remember the exact year but at least for 18 to 24 months we had this payment gateway where we were giving them about 25% okay then we figured out there's another payment gateway which is much more economical and then we moved on to that payment gateway okay okay so it wasn't a problem for too long it wasn't a problem yeah that 25% was hurting us for a bit yeah 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 um and that sort of brings to mind uh cash flow did you guys ever have any any issues with cash flow and and or was it pretty much just steady income revenue coming in uh i mean we have been fortunate to have the reverse problems with cash flow what do we what do we do with the cash that's coming in really yeah so uh because we have kept a very lean operation right from the start so first it was just me then two guys in a bedroom then when we got our first office as well it was very gradual hiring and we've been very uh 
or it's a cognizant of the fact where we want to spend that money uh, while we do want to spend on new initiatives, on the growth initiatives or the newer products, it has to justify a clear outcome for uh, most of the things. Yes, things will work, things will fail. Uh, but every single year in the last 17 years, actually every single quarter in the last 68 quarters, we've been profitable. So wow. uh, lucky not to have had cash flow problems, so to speak. Congratulations. And also bootstrapped, right? Profitable and bootstrapped. That's, that is right. That is an accomplishment in this ecosystem, I think. You know, that's very rare to have. Well, people have conflicting opinions. I think I just chose this path and sort of liking it, so can't complain. There you go. And and I, it's what you said, uh, 20, 28,000 uh, customers, and you only have a team size of about, was it 100 and... So we have never crossed 100 across the organization. So within the organization, we have uh, what you may call multiple ventures. Fusion Charts is one of them. Then we have another venture called Collabion. Uh, Charts.com is another one of them. Then we had a few of them in the past, some of which did not work out. So for the Fusion Charts business unit, um, as of now, we are about 65 people. 65 people serving 28,000 customers. That is right. Yeah. And we like to keep it that way. In fact, there could be better ways as well, more leaner ways to do it. So uh, another question that I have is, um, I mean, things seem to be going well so far, right? You're, you're sort of scaling things up. Your team is getting bigger. You have a good culture. You're profitable. You're bootstrapped. You've got these big Fortune 500 companies. I mean, was there ever a point in your journey where you were even worried about the sort of the future of your company? Oh, well, a whole lot of times. I mean, we have had three near-death experiences just in the Fusion Charts uh, part of the journey. And then we have had so many failed products or ventures internally as well. Uh, the goal is to keep trying. And if I have to delve into those three near-death experiences, uh, sometime in 2007, an Eastern European company copied our source code and they released a cheaper version of our product. So our uh, source code was always open, commercially open source. They took it, modified it, uh, made it look very similar to our product, started selling it for cheaper. Fortunately for us, uh, we had a newer version of our product coming in. So the version they copied, we made that open source we realized that we can't win a legal fight against them. I mean, the Eastern European regulations at that point in time was not so airtight. So that helped us save the day at that point in time. And there was a rather pleasant effect of that, pleasant side effect, when we made the previous version free and open source. That just helped us get so many more users of our product who would use the free version and then move to the commercial version. Oh, so something okay. which was supposed to kill us actually made us much stronger. That's the trait of a true entrepreneur where you're able to turn sort of a disaster into a win, right? Uh, well, you only boast about stories which work. So hey, there are a whole bunch of stories you don't talk about because that didn't work. So hindsight is twenty twenty. There you go. Uh, the second time when, so our product has always been in flash starting from 2002 till, to, till about 2010. And 2010, uh, when Steve Jobs released iPhone, he said no more flash on that. And eight years of our product development would not work on something which is going to be the device of the future. At that point in time, we had to go partner with a competitor to build this new technology uh, in JavaScript. And that competitor, that partner, which is a cooperation, is still our number one competitor right now. Oh. So we partnered with them. We still compete with them. Obviously, we have our own IP right now. So at that point in time, uh, again, we were on the edge of just edge of the cliff basically trying to figure out what to do so that worked out well yeah that's um, where i think luck um or the lack thereof sort of comes into the picture right i think a lot of the times uh you know people take a lot of credit for the successes um or the failures but but typically i think we're more inclined to take uh credit for the success and then when the failure comes it's like well that was external right but i think your story is a good example of how you were able to respond um, to an external sort of uh, roadblock, something that could have potentially killed your company, um, but you decided to, instead of doubling down on Flash and saying, well, forget about iPhone, uh, you instead decided, okay, we gotta, we gotta transition through this. We gotta sort of pivot our product a little bit to accommodate this, this new technology. Right, I mean, there's always headwinds and tailwinds for your business. Uh, not all ta tailwinds are uh, just factors of your skill. There's a lot of luck and not all headwinds again are a factor that you can control. These are factors beyond your control and you just have to adjust to them. So yeah, it's, uh, I mean, I would say it's a good combination of luck and skill. Mm -hmm. If you take the luck part of out, luck part of it out, I think that's being, uh, uh, I, I don't even have a word for it. I think luck is an important part for this, a part of every business. Absolutely, it is. 
Um, and then the, you said there was three. So three, what yeah. was the third? So third, what happened, uh, this somewhere around 2014, 15, uh, there was an influx of venture money in the B2C companies in India. And that time the talent pool in India was not so deep. So everybody wanted to go out to existing companies, get their guys, push their guys at any cost possible. And given that we are bootstrapped, our DNA was not to basically match every possible salary which is being offered out there. And we are not talking about a 20, 30% raise. We are talking about straight 2X and 3X being offered. So uh, literally our entire engineering team got wiped uh, in a span of about six months. So I had to then go back, rebuild the engineering team. Took us a couple of years to rebuild that. Yeah, I mean, it's not really, you can't blame them because you know the salaries would have been better elsewhere. But right. I mean, so what, what were you able to do to get them back on board? How did you convince them or did you just we built a new team, you we completely a new built a new team. So we realized that uh, this is a fight we can't win. Uh, it's a democracy, people have the choices. Uh, rather than looking at it as something where we want to stop those people, we took a different path saying, hey, what if we don't uh, fight that war? Let's go to Calcutta, let's hire from colleges, train those people, pick the smartest guys out there, pay them well as uh, freshers, train them well, uh, get them to at least work for us for between two to three years and after those two to three years, when they move to some of these best companies in the world, I'm not just talking about India, they will carry our brand, our legacy, they are our alumni. So rather than taking it as a way to say, hey, you guys, we trained you, you can't go. Uh, the only request we have is while you're here, contribute well enough. And when you move ahead, uh, just go spread the good word around us. And that has been happening with us for the last three, four years. Some of our guys are at Uber, some have uh, joined LinkedIn, some are at Microsoft. And these are people who, some are at Walmart Labs as well. And these were guys who had just joined fresh from college uh, at Fusion Charts. Mm -hmm. So that's something which again worked out uh, in our favor. What is some advice or what, sorry, what is your perspective on overcoming challenges? Like what differentiates the entrepreneurs who their startups don't succeed, right? Even if they have a great idea, but then some, you know, big challenge comes along and, and, and wipes them out and they're not able to overcome that challenge versus the entrepreneurs who you know, do overcome? I guess, I don't know if you have an answer for that question, but um, I'm very curious to know. So I'm gonna connect it to what I said earlier. Uh, there's a lot of element of luck playing in this. So the whole idea is to rinse and repeat. Play for variance, double down on what works. So not everything you do will work. Uh, so spread out your bets across different initiatives or across different approaches to the problem. Uh, anything which works, you double down on it and you live to tell a good story. Anything which does not work, should not bog you down. Uh, yes, there could be a series of things which don't work and uh, after which you'll have to take a hard call to shut down either your company, in our case we have shut down products, internal ventures, but that's just part of the game. So there's nothing to feel bad about it. Sort of coming away from uh, the challenges and the near death experiences, um, what are some of the big milestones or the big achievements that you guys have been able to accomplish in the last, say, five years? Uh, so in the last five years, I think we have built two new ventures uh, completely independently internally. Uh, Charts.com is one of them. Uh, so internally, the way we build ventures is uh, pick out a team, either an existing team from Fusion Charts, some of them, and hire some more people, have them completely quarantined from the existing team, uh, build a new product for potentially a new market as well, and let them run independently like a startup within a startup. So that has worked out well for us. On the Fusion Chart side, we've been able to uh, continue building more products, but the thing of uh, thing which brings me pride is without uh, almost any involvement from me. So the team has been able to conceive new products, execute on them, uh, put the GTM strategy around it, and ensure that those products are a success. So that brings me great pride saying that uh, more than building a product, now the function is to build a team, which, and then the function is to build an independent organization. Uh, that has worked out well for us. Uh, then from the hiring, uh, on the hiring side, like this again post 2015, we've been able to build a model where we can take in college graduates and convert them to extremely good engineers in a span of, uh, let's say about two years. And in the, after those two to three years, uh, they go and join some of the world's best companies and at salaries which are extremely competitive. Uh, so that model has worked very well for us. Sure, yeah, well congratulations on everything that you guys have been able to accomplish. I think it's huge um, that not only are you sort of benefiting uh, the companies uh, that have chosen Fusion Charts uh, as a product, but also your employees, right? I think that's something that's really touching to hear that people are going, they're, they're walking away from Fusion Charts maybe after those two, three, four years, 
but they still remember um, the learnings that they were able to acquire here. Um, and they still think fondly back on, on the memories that they've made in this company. That's a, that's a really big deal, I think. Oh, yes, they do. And we are, we are really happy about that. Yeah, I think that's, that's something which is going to last us a, la a lifetime. Exactly, exactly. So my last question um, is, what is the path forward for Fusion Charts uh, 2020? And even just, I think, you know, what does the next decade look like for you moving into into the 20s, I guess, now we can say, right? I think it's been the same for the last 17 years and we're gonna continue on that. Build good products, take pride in your craft, ensure uh, we keep growing profitably, uh, the team is happy and they keep on learning and uh, healthy work-life balance, so nothing changes in that. And at, on top of that, uh, the passion that we have for this industry, data visualization, uh, that is something we want to keep on innovating on, so that's something which helps us keep going. So. Uh, yeah, that's, a, that's how we'd like to paint it with a very broad stroke. That was Palav Nadhani, founder of Fusion Charts. And I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode from the archives. I know it's not something that we normally do. Next week, we're going to be back on track with an exciting company in the EV space. But until then, thank you so much for watching or listening, and I'll catch you in the next one.